Hello from the United States and welcome to the unveiling of Freya, the world's only full body fascia plastinate. I'm Barbara Bellanova, Executive Director of Fascia Research Society. In a moment, I will be turning you over to the team in Berlin. People are asking if there's sound on. Is, is, can everyone hear me? Great, thank you, let me continue. In a moment, I will be turning you over to the team in Berlin, but first to the members of Fascia Research Society who are joining us here today, and to all the others who are not on behalf of the Fascia Research Society Board of Directors and myself, we want to thank you for being a part of this unique and respected organization. We are looking forward to seeing you in Montreal next se September for the sixth International Fascia Research Congress. Also on behalf of the FRS board and myself, we want to thank everyone involved in bring, bringing Freya to the world. It is without a doubt Freya will change, inform, and educate how researchers and manual therapists understand the fascial system. Toward the end of our broadcast today, we will have a brief Q&A session with questions from the audience. You can type your questions throughout the broadcast in the chat box. While we won't be able to answer them all, we will do our very best to answer as many as a lot time allows. Once again, welcome to this extraordinary event, the unveiling of Freya, the world's first full body plastinate. And now we will join Dr. Angelina Wally, the curator and CEO of Body Worlds and the Freya team in Berlin. First and foremost, Barbara, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you watch. We have quite an international audience today from all over the world for this very special moment. We're here live in Berlin, right in the center of Be um, Berlin at the Body Worlds Museum. I'm sure the vast majority of you is familiar with the concept of Body Worlds. It's a touring exhibition on the human body that features real anatomical specimens that are permanently preserved by a technology called plastination. And Body Worlds is particularly known for its very spectacular, very detailed, dissected anatomical specimens that shows the human anatomy down to the finest level. But our approach has always been very traditional. Like the anatomists of the past 500 years, we never really paid much attention on the connective tissue. It typically ended up in the dissection waste. And that thinking changed dramatically when we were approached by Dr. Robert Schleib. I'm sure you know Robert, he is one of the most recognized fascia researcher in the world. He contacted us around three, four years ago and asked us, wouldn't you prepare to work on an entire body that would emphasize the fascial structure? Well, I must say we were a little reluctant, or not only a little reluctant, um, not that we didn't find the project interesting enough, but the question was, how could we accomplish an entire body that would emphasize a system that is responsible to interconnect everything else? As soon as you open up the body, you have altered the system already. So what could we take away, what could we dissect uh, without losing this interconnectivity that we ought to unveil? It was absolutely clear it would require a complete different approach, a complete different dissection principle um, that, f from that differed completely from our um, the traditional work. In addition, we were of course aware that plastination would have a major impact on the final result. So we were in no way certain that we wouldn't end up with a specimen that would surface ours and all others' expectations. But what Robert, he kept on being very smart and very charming as always, but equally persisting, so we finally agreed. That was around three years ago. And fortunately enough, we didn't have to do this on our own. 
because very soon volunteers came up from the fascist society saying, wow, we would be really more than happy to join the project and help you dissecting. So we had more than 20 volunteers working in our labs in Germany and I'm sure many of them are currently watching this program and I have to express our utmost gratitude and respect for all your work and all your dedication. Coming all the way from all the various places from the world, joining us in, uh, in Germany, in your free time, on your own expense, that was really a wonderful contribution that uh, you made. And I'm sure in a moment we will unveil Freier and you will agree it was worth each and every effort. So thank you so much. I am sure you won't be disappointed. I'm very happy to introduce now those two people who were absolutely crucial for the success of the entire project. And first and foremost, I have to introduce you to Dr. Vladimir Cheriminsky. Vladimir is an atomist. He is originating from Kyrgyzstan and he's working with us in Plastination for now more than 25 years. Well, without you without your de dedication, without your expertise in both anatomy and Plastination, I guess we would have never been able to accomplish a project like this. Thank you so much. Thank you Angela, for your introduction. But of course, it cannot be a one-man show. It needs a sparing partner that would help to to discuss things and to point out what is necessary and what we ought to change and that is where our next guest stepped in and that is gary carter from the uk gary thank, thank you so much you. for all your dedication gary you should know he is a very experienced anatomical teacher particularly in fascia anatomy and for the past 30 years he has also been a manual therapist so all his expertise, and particularly his practical experience, were absolutely essential for the entire uh, success of the project. You both were really the brains behind the project. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm also pleased to introduce two further guests today, and that is first and foremost uh, Rachelle Clausen. Rachelle, uh, she is one of these volunteers. Uh, I guess she is, was the most dedicated one. She flew in from the United States, from San Diego, seven times to work with us several weeks in a row. And I'm so glad you are here, and together with our next guest, Dr. Robert Schleip, you both will moderate this special evening tonight. But before we continue with the unveiling, and I'm sure everyone is already very curious, Raul, can you please share with us again your thoughts that you had in the beginning? Why did you feel a project like Fryer is so important? What was your, your, your thought about it? What was your expectation and what was your experience along the way seeing the project real being realized? Well, first of all, a huge thank you to Gunther von Hagens for inventing Plastination and for him and his whole team for bringing body worlds into the world. And uh, it has had a big impact on my life. I went to many of the exhibitions. It had a big impact on me personally and also for my respect for the miracle called life and how precious it is whenever I go to this exhibition. Yet, whenever I went to these exhibitions, I kept thinking fascia could be more emphasized in it than it already is included. And that's how I reached out to you several times. <laughs> and finally, we got together with a small team. And I must say, what has been achieved now is so much larger than anything we could have developed ourselves. And that, for me, is the biggest surprise of the whole project, how the team spirit of dozens of people from all over the world who are inspired by fascia, who are coming together, bringing in their passion, bringing in their debates, questions. So I learned a lot that if you want to understand fascia, it works very well to become a good networker. So I'm very overwhelmed by whatever has been achieved and my personal contribution is very small compared with what we are seeing today. But you kept the ball rolling and thanks to your passionate pushing 
make us decide for the uh, for this project and looking backwards it was really worth the effort so i think now it's perfect moment to go ahead and let everyone see our new beauty So after the unveiling, we will invite you to take a moment to follow the camera in life for this very precious moment. Where well, dozens of people from all over the world have worked. of anatomy this is quite unique that we emphasize the tissue that normally lands in the garbage bin of the dissector Welcome everyone. We're so very pleased to have you with us this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are, and to invite you to a deeper look to the story of Freya. We have uh, been looking forward to this day for a very long time, as many as you probably all have as well. Whether you know a lot about fascia or you know very little, we are sure that in the upcoming moments you're having a lot to see and a lot to enjoy. So Rochelle and I, we have spent a lot of time with Freya, yeah. but we imagine that some of you may have some questions from a manual or movement uh, therapy perspective or from a scientific perspective. So we invite you to sit back while we direct some of these questions to Dr. Cheraminski and to Gary Carter. So let's get started with our very first question and our first up-close look at fascia. So Dr. Cheraminski, We'd like to start just by saying that we know that Body Worlds is full of many beautiful plastinates, but as was being discussed earlier, um, a lot of these plastinates were dissected from a classical anatomy point of view. So from that point of view, did you demonstrate fascia in any of the plastinates before now? Yeah, although we are quite traditional <coughs> so in presenting anatomy, human anatomy, Body Worlds exhibition has definitely several specimens which display certain fascia elements or fragments of fascia. But Frey is absolutely unique project because this is the first whole body plastinate ever which is displaying um, almost all the possible types of fascia on one body from the very superficial ones like subcutaneous tissue to the superficial fascia down to the deep fascia internal fascia of the thoracic cavity and also the visceral fascia of the mediastinum and visceral fascia of the neck Dr. Cheraminsky, yeah. when you started this project with us together, what did you expect to achieve? <laughs> what did, did I expect to, to achieve? The first, <laughs> yeah. the first goal, the first goal and the main goal of um, uh, this project was to bring the understanding of fascia. Um, I think in the simplest way which is possible, 
to the general public and also to professionals. Yeah, so my initial task was to incorporate as much as possible types of fascia on one body. And uh, so we have achieved this. Um, during our, our long discussions, I think we decided to put on, one, on this body, on the Freya, um, both the classical representation of fascia and also the functional or dynamic anatomy of fascia. Gary, if I'm wrong, no, you can correct me. Really <laughs> um, no, I, I see that uh, you know, classical anatomy doesn't necessarily give us an understanding of what moving, movement is. Mm -hmm. So when we start to look at the fascial anatomy, that links everything together and it describes movement in a much better way. But as we've had these many discussions before, you can't throw away the classical anatomy. I think the classical anatomy has to be deeply respected and we, we blend the two elements uh, together. Yeah. That's really, really important in my book. The posture of Freya is so striking and very elegant. I'm wondering, and our audience may be too, is there any particular reason that this posture was chosen or does it have anything to do with what's actually trying to be shown through the dissection as well? Well, after speaking with the um, scientific advisors and the getting their ideas, um, what I took from that is to, well, the common theme actually from the scientific advisors was continuity. Mm. So many ideas, but continuity was the main theme. And from there I took um, Vladimir's initial design, design and we started to introduce um, elements of design from the, the leaders within the fashion research field. And by doing, doing that, really uh, we have Freya is uh, our first fascial focus plastina, um, introducing all of those ideas into it. And also what we've done is kept one of the traditional anatomical dissection ideas, which is to have the superficial tissues on the right side and then slightly deeper tissues on the left side, but we've done it with a fascial focus. Mm -hmm. So respect to the classical, but then um, come at that from a, um, a fascial focus. Mm -hmm. So from there, um, mm -hmm. keeping continuity, what we're looking at is continuity from surface to depth and then from head to foot. So if I can then bring our camera round towards um, Freya's left elbow and I'll come behind our camera person here. So um, if we're looking at Freya's left elbow, as we start to sweep across Freya, um, what we're looking at are sweeps and curves and spirals that sweep down the back of her body. But also what we look at in one of the spirals is the posterior oblique sling. So we've got the latissimus dorsi and its associated fascia, the thracolumbar fascia going into the gluteus maximus and its associated fascia, which is delving deep underneath what would be the adipose tissue. And then what we see is these tissues and the more superficial tissues sweeping around her body so that we've got much more of a, um, a fluid line that runs through her body and then it wraps around her leg and goes underneath her heel. And if the camera just gently sweeps out a little bit more, we take that form and that shape in. And really these sort of fluid qualities in her form are depicting um, the kind of movement patterns that we see in fascial movement trainings. And <coughs> along with that, what we find is the twist in her torso is linking the um, posterior oblique sling as well. So beautiful. It's so nice to see all the, the curved lines as opposed to the square cuts, because the body really isn't linear in, in squares and Absolutely. angles. Everything yeah. so is curved. In fact, the fluidity, um, the fluidity is depicting also the flow that we understand in fascial movement and in terms of also how we might work with our hands too. Mm. Good point. Yeah. So what would you say is the main difference uh, from this new functional fascia oriented perspective towards the traditional classical perspective of the human body. Yeah, I think for, yeah, from my opinion there is quite a big difference. Um, <coughs> although we, we know that fascia is, uh, is a Cinderella tissue, yeah, Robert? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, but we should remember that fascia was studied and very well described already in 18th and 19th centuries in regards to surgical approaches, to distribution, to split and um, uh, to, uh, to, to the split of inflammatory processes, also in trauma surgery and in uh, reconstructive surgery as well. 
So uh, fascia and fascial septa thought uh, to split, to separate mm -hmm. organs and structures like muscles from the nerves and vessels. Um, thought to be um, fascial compartments or fascial sheath. Um, so we have prepared here a um, couple of such classical examples like on, on this abdominal, lower abdominal portion. Um, we have made a classical window in, into the uh, fascial sheath of rectus abdominis muscle. And down there, um, on the lower leg, we have shown the classical representation of the muscular fascial compartments. Mm -hmm. So speaking of dissection, did you have more to say? Yeah, so, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, oppositely in functional anatomy, I mm. remember, so the fascia is the main element of continuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting to learn these differences. But speaking of the different yeah. dissections, Gary, you and I were in the dissection lab together with Dr. Cherminsky yeah. quite oh, a yes. lot. <laughs> and I think a lot of the viewers also have probably taken some dissection workshops that had a fascial focus to them, as, as you have in the past. Was there much of a difference in your experience from dissecting for the purpose of learning about fascial anatomy versus creating a fascial plastinate? Um, yes, yeah, so as Dr. Angelina Wally said at the opening, um, it's a different way of thinking. When we're classically in dissection labs and we've both been in those together mm. with various colleagues, um, we might be in there for six days or ten days. Mm. But what we find in that process is that we're having to move through the tissue structures very quickly. So we're learning as we go, but we're doing it at a particular pace. And most of that tissue is being taken down and then removed and then go to the next structure taken down and it's removed. But here we're dissecting to preserve. Mm -hmm. So we're dissecting, preserving, dissecting, preserving. And um, a comment that we used to say when we were in the lab together is that we are removing fascial tissue to display fascial tissue, mm -hmm. which was always quite interesting to go through that process. Um, but along with that is that the, the fascial structures that are removed or separated from the underlying structures after a period of time become quite vulnerable, quite mm -hmm. weak, um, they lose their support. And we have to be very careful in, in terms of Freya because the whole body here is dissected. This is the thing from, from every part of her was considered. So obviously she's been turned around a lot. Mm -hmm. So we would have to protect those um, fascial membranes that were reflected. So what we were also understanding from that is that the structures that the fascia has been reflected from um, the fascia is dependent upon that structure for its strength. Right. But also the structures underneath are dependent on the fascia <laughs> for its support and yeah. shape and function. Um, so they're completely interdependent with each other, which uh, that, I mean, we, we have understood it, but to see it and to feel it is, is a, a big experience there. And along the way, as we're dissecting, we had to keep considering how the final form would appear. Mm -hmm. So as you know, there was constant readaptions to design because we knew at some point, oh, that's not going to display very well. Let's remodel it. Let's look at that two o'clock in the morning drawings and so on and so on and so on. That went on forever. Um, so it's a very different way of thinking. And I think that way of thinking has stayed with me forever. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think also you, the length of time that's required for this is you don't really think about like to create something like this. It have to go day in and day out and day in and over the course of six months was yeah. this project for just Absolutely. dissecting, which you can see it was six months worth of work yeah. at the very what least. Well, almost the longest dissection. That you've ever yeah, had, yeah. yeah but, the um, detail really because of the really delicacy was so challenging. Yeah, we've had that discussion it, as well it. where you're saying it is the longest and because it's the first of mm. its kind, it's, it takes up a lot of time. Really amazing. Yeah. So kind of in that same vein with the, the manual therapists and the movement practitioners, yeah. how do you see that um, Freya, what can Freya offer them to help them in a practical sense? Like what would be the clinical applications yeah. that they might gain from being able to see Freya now that she's been completed? Yeah, from a manual therapy point of view. So um, as a manual therapist, what we've mm -hmm. decided to do is to maintain the skin. So if we can bring the camera to the back of Freya once again, and once again, I'll come to the left of our camera person. Um, so what we decided to do is to keep the skin. And um, Robert Schleiper came into our lab at one point and he looked at our 
the plans and the design. And he said to me, oh, oh, you're keeping the skin. And we had suggested, well, the skin is collagen base. Mm -hmm. It's part of a fascial structure, but as a manual therapist, it's, it's the region we touch. That's the only way that we start to make contact with the body is through the skin. And what we've done here in keeping the skin intact is that we've reflected the skin slightly and we can still see the skin ligaments in touch with or continuous to the next tissue down, which is a superficial fascia. That then takes us through continuously to the deep fascia, to the epimyceal fascia of the muscle, with which the epimyceum then invests the muscle tissue. But between these surfaces, we have um, a loose areola fascia. So what that does is that permits glide from one surface to the next. And if we can bring the camera down just to the, the middle of the back region, what we see here is maybe a little bit more relationship between these particular surfaces. And this is quite a deep region into the, mm -hmm. um, the lumbar tissue. But it's the textures that we're really interested in. And if we can really learn to um, appreciate the textures, and I quote Gil Headley there because he's the one person that really brought this to light, is that once we can start to understand those textures, we really start to have a different sense of what we're doing in our clinical practice. And for me, it's made a huge difference in clinical practice because um, in terms of treatment of low back pain, how we might deal with neck issues or frozen shoulder, um, it, makes, it makes a big, big difference mm. to the way that we treat. And we're just keeping the camera where it is just to, to look at that view yeah. and I'll keep talking. Um, that when we understand um, tensional relationships in the body, that really helps us to work on scar tissue and understand how to treat scar tissue and also how we start to treat injury too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it's really remarkable to see what's beneath the skin so that you know what it is that, that, that you're feeling. We talk about having your fingers become like they have x-ray vision and the touch becomes more sharp and more precise. And after seeing that and interacting with it, I think without going into the mm. dissection lab, actually, that there's the possibility of that being it's shared. It's so informative. It's really great. Mm. I remember that you, Vladimir, convinced us to show the architecture of one tissue layer, like the superficial fascia, not only in one region, but in many areas. So why was that so important? Yeah, because <coughs> so different areas have different functions, of course. Mm -hmm different functions and uh, different uh, anatomical features as well. Let's take an example um, of the subcutaneous tissue here, for example, for example here on the abdominal area. Um, adipose lobules are linked to the weak, weak um, elastic network, mm -hmm. so which is basically explains the sagging of the adipose tissue due to obesity. So the belly again. Um, oppositely, oppositely to that, um, can we go a little bit down here? So um, the stroma of the subcutaneous tissue of the limbs is quite very well developed. Um, that's why it, um, it has the capability, ability to maintain the shape and uh, maintain the nice co configuration of the um, extremities, even um, due to some excessive adipose tissue on them. Um, if we take a look, close look, that's another point, if we take a close look at the adipose tissue and the or sub subcutaneous tissue here on the uh, thigh, you can see these small threads of um, blood vessels, which is showing how good, how well um, subcutaneous tissue is vascularized. This also explains one why um, obese people have um, increased blood vol um, volume and also high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Imagine that one kilogram of adipose tissue required about 10 kilometers of blood vessels. Wow. <laughs> That's a remarkable. Wow. Very good. Mm. So maybe some 
um, continuities. Yeah, yeah. So that was the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, you emphasized very much, Gary, that we should include uh, as much force transmission continuities as possible. And from the many different options, you included a lot of them. Can you just pick two or three yes. of force transmission Yeah, we, we have a lot of various examples <laughs> around, around France. That was a big topic in our group. <laughs> so um, if I go to this side of our camera person once again, that wonderful camera person, can bring the camera through here. Um, what we have here is um, into the axilla, so the area of the armpit. Um, first of all, we have the uh, petrolis major reflected. And then what we've done from that is reflected the petrolis fascia. And you can see the petrolis fascia is actually quite thick. It's not really that thick in reality um, in dissection. It's much thinner than that. It was a tissue we were worried about that during plastination it's thickened up, which is actually what's in our favor. Um, but what we also see is that this um, petrolis fascia is continuous all the way around and then becomes the brachial fascia. And as that becomes the brachial fascia, it's also continuous down here to the latissimus dorsi fascia as well. So latissimus dorsi fascia and um, petrolis fascia actually make one myofascial continuity along with other structures. Thank you, David is on back for that. Um, <laughs> and that takes us on to the um, brachial fascia. And so those two are continuous onto the brachial fascia. And then we come round onto the anti-brachial fascia. And if the camera could come round, because one of my favorite, well, I've got so many favorite parts of Freya. Um, but I love the sweep and the tension that we see through this quality of the tissue here. But we know that all of this tissue is well innovated um, with sensory nerve endings, and they become much more abundant as they travel towards the wrist. So that gives credence to um, the arm's position um, and its proprioception in space. If we can then bring the camera around to Freya's right arm, and Freya's right palm is facing up, and it's like he's trying to tickle Vladimir from there. Um, and what we're looking at is the lateral portion of the arm. And um, we've got many windows here, but it's this particular window that I'm interested in seeing. Um, this is a, a very familiar cut. Rochelle knows this very well. We, we've, it's a cut that we've named in the lab called the Canoe Cut. Um, it's gives, refer gives reference to Carla Stecco's work from her book, um, where we see the, um, fa the muscular fibers get their origin from the fascial surround. So they are continuous to the antibrachial fascia. So muscle, of course, is continuous to its tendon. Muscle is, of course, continuous to the next muscle along the line. But also it gets, in certain parts of the body, its continuity or attachments to the um, antibrachial fascia. So simply put, what it does when it engages is it sucks that um, fascial surround closer to it, increasing the pressure, which brings more um, efficiency to the muscular action. And I'm all one for efficiency when it comes to the movement of the body. Um, if we can then sweep the camera around, and we'll bring this round to Freya's left foot. So the foot that she's standing on. And if we just have a little bit of a view of the Achilles as well with the foot. What we see here is that Freya is standing on the balls of her left foot. Um, and we see a lot of force uh, applied through the uh, plantar fascia. And that, that force is still going to be there even though she's placed onto the stand. And that force transmission goes across the um, calcaneus and then onto the Achilles tendon. This is a very well known myofascial continuity. Um, and in fact, if you actually want to embody uh, Freya's standing position whilst you're here viewing, why don't you come and stand on your left ball of your left foot, put your right foot forwards, and take your right arm out to the side and twist, and you know exactly how much this region's got to take. Um, I don't know whether you just fell over just then. <laughs> so here we've got the plantar fascia, and usually the plantar fascia in anatomy books is described as a separate structure. Um, and in some body worlds exhibits, not all of them, of course, um, we see the plantar fascia described as a separate structure too. However, the flexor digitorum brevis muscle, which is deep to the plantar fascia, is also continuous to it. So you can see some of the fibers there. We weren't able to get all of them. Um, but we see some of the fibers coming into the foot and making it continuous. So thank you for that question, Ra. Yeah, that's really amazing, all of these deep fascia connections. But there's a lot of superficial fascia that's on Freya as well. And uh, there's no fat in this superficial fascia post-plastinated, right? So it's a very interesting thing to even know that fact, because there's still a lot of tissue there without mm -hmm. adipose. It's also a kind of a complicated tissue, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So as I mean, as you've 
you've just right described, and what we've got is, um, in my mind, uh, one of the first body worlds forms mm. that I've seen with probably the most artificial fascia on it, but I don't know, that, that might be somewhere in the world, I'm not sure, but this is the most that I've seen. Um, and this would usually be known as adipose tissue as well, but there's no adipose tissue in this, as you rightly said. Mm -hmm. It's the architecture that holds that together, it's left behind. So the adipose tissue has been separated from that and removed, and we have this architecture. Um, in the uh, fascia community, this region as a whole is known as um, superficial fascia. But in a clinical setting, um, the superficial fascia is a membrane that sits deeper within the adipose tissue, mm -hmm. um, separating the deep um, adipose tissue from the superficial adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. um, However, Vladimir will be able to give us an example of where this is present on, on Freya's body and its clinical relevance. So over to you, Vladimir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are a lot of confusions and misunderstanding in mm -hmm. the interpretation of the superficial fascia and also in the terminology. Um, that's why we basically wanted to show one classical example of the superficial fascia and we expose it here on the lower abdominal quadrant. Um, that's, a, that's a scarpus fascia, which is partially reflected from the deep fascia of the abdomen. Mm -hmm. And it still has some uh, continuity to the deep fascia. It looks to me like uh, an unhealthy adhesion, would you agree? Yes, we see um, on the upper Yeah, on the portion. inferior portion, yeah. is, that's the healthy uh, continuity. Yeah. On, yeah. And you are right, so on the, on the upper portion of the scarpus fascia, you can see the scar from yeah. the appendectomy. Ah, so it's from yeah. surgery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a fusion, so, so to say. So these adhesions can be created by surgery, but they could also be created by lack of movement. All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Cool. So another area where I remember we had lots of discussion because it is very special is the whole head and neck area. Oh, and right. uh, we had to emphasize which fascial continuities to emphasize. Can you explain what we now incorporated into this fascia specimen? Yeah, that was actually one of the, my favorite part of the day session. I remember. I spent, <laughs> I spent uh, quite a bit of time. That, yeah. Uh, doing cranial dissection. So here we have um, shown uh, both yeah, the superficial fascial elements and also the deep fascias, the temporal fascia as a deep fascia. From the superficial elements we have um, um, presented here three layers, the skin, sub sub subcutaneous tissue here, and gala aponeurotica or epicranial neurosis. So this kind of construction is quite important in uh, trauma surgery. Um, basically it explains the severity of the head injuries, the, soft the injuries of the soft tissues of the cranial. Um, <coughs> also so um, we can see the co continuity of the uh, epicranial aponeurosis to another superficial fascia of the head, that's a parietotemporal fascia, which is very often used in the reconstructive surgery be because of its um, very, very, very good vascularization. You can see by the uh, superficial temporal artery here. Mm -hmm. So, and the next um, layer, that's a temporal fascia, is a deep fascia, right? <coughs> so that continuity might also explain some types of tensional headache that they reach up into these special layers. Yeah, absolutely. So there are several um, scientific works on it. And uh, here we, we have exposed um, <coughs> continuity of the uh, cranial fascia. Could you please let's go a little bit backwards here? Yeah. Continuity of the um, cranial fascia to the um, neck fascia or cervical fascia, the, uh, the deep cervical fascia, deep neck fascia has basically three layers. Um, the layer or leaflet which is presented here, that's an investing fascia or investing uh, leaflet which surrounds the trapezius muscle 
and sternocleida mastoideus muscle. That's a more superficial lamina. The second one, or middle lamina of the uh, cervical fascia, or pretracheal fascia, um, envelops the infrahyoid muscles here. And another quite important uh, fascia, we shouldn't forget about this, uh, that's a visceral fascia of the neck, yeah, which is a uh, continuation of the buccopharyngeal fascia. So this fascia envelopes all the cervical viscera and continues inferiorly through the thoracic aperture into the thoracic cavity, mm -hmm. forms the mediastinal visceral fascia. It and is fa very yeah. nicely shown. Exactly, yeah. it's very nicely shown. And so this mediastinal visceral fascia connects to the fibrous uh, pericardium. So the deepest layer of the cervical fascia, that's a prevertebral um, fascia, which, is, which has also very um, important practical uh, value. First of all, it, um, it forms the retroesophageal space together with the visceral fascia. And second, it forms the neurofascial uh, sheath, which um, continues along the, the nerves of the brachial plexus, so continues into the axillary er area, which basically explains transmission of the inflammatory processes mm -hmm. from the neck area to the axillary area and other way around. So and it's yeah beautifully represented here. I think it's so dramatic and amazing that this dissection design was allows us to go all the way inside and back out again yeah, to see can, those we deep can, continuities. Yeah, we can speak hours about yeah. the <laughs> clinical importance on this, this particular body. Yeah. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we don't have hours as much as we would love to, and we think you might as well, but we do have one final prepared question, which Gary would like to ask. Um, just as we now have Freya as a demonstration of the full body fascial system, how do you see as an educator that this may affect or impact fascia education moving forward? Well, firstly, I, mean, I just wanted to sit there and listen to Vladimir for ages because what he's just <laughs> talking about, I want to keep looking into that region. Into I missed the that one last yeah, time. Yeah, we've seen that so many times. Yeah. Um, but I, I, as Vladimir and I have, have described on Freya, mm. um, there's, there's so much to see through a 3D placenta. Um, I also, also there's a lot to see through dissection too. Um, but I spent a lot of time um, teaching in Body Worlds in London when it was there mm -hmm. and taking groups around to the models there. And I had to go from model to model to model to model to try and get some kind of vision and piece together how the fascia would look to my students. And what we've got here in one piece, yeah. which again was <laughs> so long putting together, is that we've got various areas that we could educate with and we could spend, actually I know we could spend more than hours, it could probably be a few days. <laughs> Weeks, um, maybe months. <laughs> but also with Freya, we've got about 40, up to at least 40 features in her. Wow. Um, so what we call vignettes between mm -hmm. us. Um, and each one tells a fascial story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite remarkable. So, you know, I, I think in, in imaging of 3D modeling of fascia, for us to be able to see it, mm. learning to see this in 3D is something we've always wanted to do. And to be able to have that on uh, a full placenta that's focused with fascia is, is astounding. I mean, all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, I just think it's exciting for our future of fascial anatomy. Indeed. That's got me emotional. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> I think we share that with you and feel it really strongly. Thank you so much for the amazing, informative, that you've spent answering these questions, but we think you may have some more questions on the other side of the camera. So we're going to reach back to Barbara and find out if uh, there's any questions that you have sent in that you might like to ask of the team. I'd like to invite Angelina to come back up and join us in case she has some questions that you might want to direct her way as well. Fantastic. Hello again, everyone. There have been a number of questions in the chat box and just in the regular chat about how was the positioning of Freya arrived at? What process did you go through? What determined the posturing? So, should I start? Do you mind? Please I go think, ahead. I think we, we had a posturing <laughs> idea from Vladimir to start with, and that was on a mouthful. 
and then we saw but that there was a female form. <laughs> it will be changed. Yeah, we did, had no yeah. idea yeah. at that point. And yeah. we saw a female form, and we started with a dancer's posture, and then that readapted, and then Angelina continued on the process with that. Yes, it was. So, so we, we were, were following, following uh, our initial plans, and uh, but when it con the work continued in the laboratory, I personally felt it doesn't feel right. She looked as if she would throw her art away. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, d I <laughs> but Volodya told me you now it was already prepositioned. There's not much that we can change. Uh, so we looked through books uh, depicting dancers and uh, found an image that was very similar to what we had already achieved. And then we ended up with this beautiful bow. So I'm very pleased, actually. Stunning. Yes, yeah, she's definitely beautiful. Lots of comments about her beauty. Um, the next question, I found this one fascinating myself, is how did you handle the cutaneous nerves that pierce through fascia? Oh, <laughs> how did we yes. handle them? So we kept, yeah, I, I, I can, yeah, I can, I can answer this question. So we, we kept some of the cutaneous nerves, um, but um, some of them we had to remove together with the of piece yeah. of the subcutaneous tissue. And together with the, the skin, of course, yeah. I just and that was m one of the many sacrifices yeah. because we discussed whether we should emphasize them in order to honor the correlations with traditional Chinese medicine. But that would have been a completely different exhibition. And that's why we cle clearly followed uh, Dr. Cherminsky's advice to focus on the deeper layers. I also found this question very interesting. It, um, it's from Amanda and she said, how do you envision this piece will illuminate the understanding on the body for ordinary folks? So not manual therapists, not doctors, yeah. researchers. Um, from my experience of teaching in various body worlds, um, just how I see public and some of the public came along and tagged onto some of my sessions. They, they found them quite interesting to be able to see the structure from a different perspective, which gave them a different understanding as to how they would need to or would like to explore their body. By, by seeing it differently, we find that they start moving it differently and treat it differently. And that's, that's really been um, quite exciting for me to see. Mm -hmm. Another aspect not so much shown in this session is the other specimen uh, around here, which are focusing on the biotensegity model. And that is very interactive and that will be a secondary emphasis in people coming to this exhibition that they explore if you have a local problem, you may look for solutions in other areas of the body. Yeah. And that is very nicely, they have an interactive station where you massage the, the plantar fascia and then your arm length gets longer and you're pushing some magnets down. We have all these tensegrity models here. So that would be definitely a strong secondary outcome for all the visitors. Absolutely. Well, from my experience, being the curator of all of our body world exhibitions since its very beginning, I know that lay people, they don't come to learn anatomy. That's way too much. But it is all about gaining an image, getting an understanding. And uh, that's almost like a, a seed that you plant, drawing the interest to something and creating an image to something that they perhaps suffer from. So they are really interested, but they don't have an image. And this is what Body Worlds allows for, to really have, get an idea of what the topic is about. And I'm absolutely sure, even though many lay people will not really identify the various fascia layers, but still it will provide an overall image what fascia is about. And I think this is really important to understand the needs, the physical needs of our body, particularly in a time when uh, we can achieve almost anything while sitting while not moving. I think this is absolutely essential that we get this understanding across and make people move again. Well said. Very well, yes. So here's another fascinating question. And um, it, it, it asks, what did you leave out that you wish you could have displayed? Oh. 
<laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's the deep aspect to the, the visceral fascia, but um, we knew at some point that this was going to be primarily a superficial fascial structure um, in terms of the fascias on the surfaces of the body and just with a few peaks into the depths because um, we, we didn't know the terrain that we were really going to find and also how that tissue was going to handle the plastination process. So we had to hold ourselves back a little bit and at least give a, an entry to the world with Freya until maybe the next sessions could go deeper if should that happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also so kept uh, kept intact some some areas where we could we could, could have opened and exposed the visceral fascia, for for instance, of the abdomen. But in this case, we we should sacrifice the abdominal um, wall mm -hmm. you know, or the fascia of the abdominal wall. So. That's a rule of anatomy, you should sacrifice them. So that right. was a constant debate. How much detail are we showing yeah. and how much continuity <laughs> do yeah. we allow? Well, I think also with the beauty of body worlds is that you, you see mm -hmm. you know, the human form displayed in multiple ways. Yeah. You know, we could display it a hundred ways and there could be another hundred ways that could display it all over yeah. again. And I think with the fascial body that we could just keep doing that forever and forever and forever. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> also, we always would say that we have to take something away to show something yeah. else. And so that thing that once it's gone, like you said in the beginning, um, I, I found that constant decision process really fascinating to be a part of because yeah. you kind of want to show everything, but if you want to see everything, that's just basically you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Un exactly. Uncompromised. Yeah. Very good. So there's been a couple questions along these lines. What was the hardest part or challenge to keep the tissue as one continuous form? I think, um, as maybe I described earlier, where we're removing or separating structures from the underlying structures is where we, ha I think we had challenges in continuity because we, we very quickly realized that if we just left them the way that they were and, and the time that was spent working on her, um, those tissues would have damaged and they would have broken mm -hmm. with continuity. So it was how, how we had to keep preserving and protecting. So she's been very protected mm -hmm. <laughs> as we go down mm -hmm. line. Good, very good. A couple people have asked if we could see Freya one more time. I'm wondering if that's possible, if the camera could just do a quick sweep. Um, I, I think a lot of people would love to see her one more time. Is that possible? I think Absolutely, but I think this is what uh, was, uh, was our plan anyway, uh, towards the end of the session. How we're yeah. ending, yeah. Very good. yeah. Very good. Okay, everybody can wait for that then. Um, <laughs> let's see. I think all the questions that we had are pretty much um, what have been asked so far, so this might be a good time to bring this to a close. Um, there's just been so many wonderful comments in the comment section. I hope all of you get a chance to take a look at them. Um, lots of thank yous, lots of really wonderful, wonderful things. So um, that's that part. And um, just uh, bring this to a little bit of a closing. And it's going to continue with a handover to Dr. Wally again. But I just want to thank you so much personally and from the board of directors of the Fascia Research Society for our time together is coming to a close. And we're also very pleased you were able to join us today. Uh, once again, I'm going to be turning the broadcast over to Berlin. But before I do that, I'd really like everybody to give a virtual standing ovation to this team and their incredible work. This has just been so outstanding. Thank you so very, very, very much. Amazing, amazing, amazing work, amazing work. Um, also, uh, I want to remind everybody today, if you want to see Freya up close and personal, she will be at the 6th International Fascia Research Congress in Montreal in September. We had quite a few questions about that. Um, again, I just want to thank you for being here today. On behalf of all of us, it's just been, this has been a wonderful, um, extraordinary experience. And now I'm going to hand this back to Dr. Wally in Berlin. Uh, I want to join in and cordially thank everyone who was part of the team, who contributed really a lot. We have achieved something that we can all be very, very proud of. Thanks to you all, to all the dissectors, to all the scientific advisors. Thanks to you four for this wonderful mm -hmm. presentation. And last but not least, thanks to the team behind this event here, who really worked oh. for two, three days minimum. 
to s get everything set up and to test and uh, to make this really a great event. I do hope you equally enjoyed <laughs> this event. Uh, now we will finish uh, our presentation by more close-up of Friar. It will be followed up uh, by a rolling list of credits. And at the very end, you are invited to join to see images that were taken while working on Friar. So I do hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I wish you a wonderful day, a wonderful evening. And I do hope one day you have the chance to see Friar in person. It's absolutely a different experience. Of course, you will be in Montreal for the uh, Fascia uh, uh, Research uh, Congress. But Friar will be on permanent display at our Borderworlds Museum in Berlin. And as you've heard, it's not only Friar. We have dedicated an entire section of our exhibition to the theme of fascia. There's a lot to see, a lot to learn. Come and visit us. So goodbye and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Please.